The following is a production of the Pritzker Military Library. Made possible by the support of the National World War II Museum. Join me, Elizabeth Brackett, for a stirring discussion about the American soldiers who liberated Nazi concentration camps, next on Citizen Soldier. Welcome to the Pritzker Military Library's Citizen Soldier, made possible in part by the support of the National World War II Museum. I'm Elizabeth Brackett. Many volumes have been written about Holocaust survivors and the unimaginable experience that those individuals endured at the hands of the Nazis. Lesser known are the stories of the American GIs who entered the camps to discover the atrocities. Already battle-worn by the hardships of combat, these young men were now faced with an experience that would make them lifelong witnesses to the horrors of the Holocaust. Joining me today are three gentlemen who research and study the stories of the Americans who took part in the liberation of concentration camps during the spring of 1945. Dr. Waitman Bourne, currently an assistant professor of history and the Lewis and Francis Blumkin Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Nebraska Omaha. Michael Hirsch is the author of eight books, including The Liberators, America's Witness to the Holocaust. Keith W. Huxon is the Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Director of Research and History at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Welcome all of you to the program. Thank you. Well, you know, most Americans are familiar with the names Auschwitz, Dachau, and Buchenwald. But apparently there were many more camps out there that we may not have heard of. Keith, what, what were some of those camps? Tell us about it. Well, there were thousands of these camps, and recent scholarship coming out of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. estimates that there were over 42,000 of these camps that served various functions. Most of the camps that were the death camps located in Poland were liberated by the advancing Soviet armies. The Allies, particularly the British and the Americans, tended to liberate camps in Western uh, Europe. And so we were not running into those death camps. However, what we found out is that these, this vast camp system had a number of different functions to it. Slave labor, among others, uh, that uh, the system was much more expansive than we had previously understood. Well, wait a minute. What were some of the differences in the kinds of camps that were there? You said some were slave labor, some were death camps. What were the differences? Initially, when the camp system is established in 1933, the targeted audience, if you will, the targeted inmate population are political opponents of the Nazi regime. Communists, socialists, trade unionists, um, anyone who sort of doesn't fit into the Nazi political attempt to take power. And from 33 to 36, these camps take a variety of different forms. Um, there's a, a series of wild camps, which are really unregulated and locally established camps on, on places like barges, basements, various kinds of buildings. Mike Hirsch, what were the kinds of camps that the American GIs came across by and large? The veterans I talked to liberated camps that are familiar to a lot of people, Buchenwald, Dachau, Dora Mittelbau, uh, Mauthausen. But I also spoke with, with guys who got to a place that was a barn with 40 women from Eastern Europe in it, and they were in the barn at night, and then during the day they were marched into the woods to manufacture hand grenades. And they told me that the women often sabotaged the hand grenades, but this was just 40 slave laborers off by themselves. So when, when Keith says the number you know, that we've heard lately is more than 40,000, it could be people, you know, camps that had as few as 25 to 50 people. But Keith, were these camps like that only had 25 or 50 people? Were, how did they fit into the overall organization of all these camps by, by the Germans? Well, they didn't have to feed this labor. Many of them were marked for death anyway. But you had a competition within the Nazi government. Hitler made the decisions, but Albert Speer most famously becomes his minister in charge of the economy and he needed to have lots of these people. 
he had to fight for this at times against uh, Himmler and some of the advocates for a strict extermination policy. So Waitman Born, who usually won that fight? Uh, in, in this particular instance, um, in the long durée, it's the exterminationists. Um, and this is regarding Jews. The way the system is, is set up is that um, there are some of the more prominent camps, Dachau, Buchenwald, Mauthausen, um, et cetera, that are, that are more well known, the larger um, camps in the system. And they would have up to hundreds and thousands of what are called subcamps or satellite camps that could be 20 people, 40 people. Um, they could take the form of a factory who has contracted the labor of the slaves, of the forced laborers, um, and is paying the SS an hourly wage to use labor and build um, war munitions or, or, or shoes or whatever it happens to be working. It could take the form of construction. Um, but these all fall under an administration. For example, um, Dachau subcamps would be managed um, by the commandant of the Dachau camp system. Well, Mike Hirsch, the American GI certainly had no idea of this. So what was some of their reaction when they began discovering these? How did they begin discovering them? The, the first camp they discovered in Germany was Ordruf, which was a subcamp of Buchenwald. And that was April 4th, 1945. And their assignment had been to look for an underground electronic communications facility um, that had uh, been built in case Berlin had to be evacuated. And it was in looking for that that they discovered this camp. I, I asked the question early on when I started doing interviews that I eventually stopped asking, um, what, what did you know about this before you got there? And the answer that just stopped me cold was, we didn't know anything, but how do you prepare somebody to see that? What difference would it have made? You, you have to keep in mind, you're talking about kids who were 18, 19, generally 20 years old. I, I mean, imagine your, your son or your grandson 18 years old and he's dropped into a situation and he's been in combat for anywhere from maybe four months to th three years and suddenly he gets to a place and the first thing he experiences is the smell and then he begins to see things. Imagine walking into a place and there's 20,000 bodies that, that have, I mean it's mass murder. How does the 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old mind wrap around that, you know. And it, it's in their mind, and they, they just don't forget it. They can try, but they don't. I, I've seen uh, many times uh, the dead, our own soldiers, stacked up like cordwood. But here were piles of uh, six, eight, ten feet high of bodies. Coming into uh, Dachau, outside of the uh, camp, was this train, and you could smell this before you ever got there. And the odor was something that uh, you just can't describe. Then going on into the camp, there were people that were alive, some of them barely alive, uh, many of them not able to live long enough to get out of the camp. You're calling them liberators, but you say there's a question there, about that. In Almost no case did the Americans or the British or the Canadian forces moving from west to east across Germany have to fight their way into a camp. There were occasional times where some shots may have been fired. But in nearly 99.9% .9 of the cases, the, the SS guards had fled. They may have fled two days before. They may have fled two hours before. Often they left and took the survivors that were in the camps who could still walk, and, and they called them death marches for a reason, and march them to another camp, or, or just away from the oncoming Allied forces, because the order had been, we don't want to have the Allies take our prisoners. But um, my problem with the word liberators is, since every American who helped liberate Europe is a liberator of the camp. Well, wait a minute, why, if, if the Americans were almost there, several days away, why were they moving people from camp to camp? What was the logic behind that? There are, there are several explanations. One is there was an order to not allow prisoners to fall into the hands of the advancing um, allies, which is an indication that at least some of the Nazi leadership recognized that there were going to be repercussions for, for their actions. 
Um, depending on what time frame we're talking about, there is also the continued desire to utilize these individuals as slave labor. And so um, as, the, as the Reich is shrinking, um, these people are viewed as economic resources and are often shipped to other camps in an attempt to employ them. However, um, and this gets to the nature of the camps that are liberated versus sort of where they are in the beginning, um, by the end of it, there's no labor for them to do. And many of these camps end up as sort of dumping grounds for excess prisoners that have been transferred from sometimes seven, eight camps, some of them traveling all the way from Minsk through the concentration camp system and ending up in, in Western Germany. So when the people that you talked to, the soldiers that you talked to, came upon these camps, who did they think was in them? Who, who did they understand? They, 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 they didn't know. Yeah. Um, the, the sight of, of coming into a camp, climbing off of your tank if you're, if you're, if you're in an armor unit, and seeing people who are walking skeletons. I, I, I talked to so many guys who said they would see people and not understand what they were looking at, and the people would walk toward them. One man in particular told me, this man's walking toward me as, as though I'm God, I'm his savior, and he drops dead right in front of me. And the US Army medics had to get out there and get the word out to the troops. Yes, you'd like to feed them, but you can't. I walked back to a place near the barracks where I had seen people lying in crude bunks. They couldn't even get out of those bunks. They were so emaciated. They would kind of wail and, and appeal to you to come and do something for them. And we had strict orders. Don't give them cigarettes, don't give them food, don't give them anything. And don't touch them because they're lice infested. Discovering the camps was a pain in the backside for, for Patton and the other army generals because their job was to, was to chase and kill Germans. That's all they were interested in, is chasing and killing Germans. They discover a camp, and the SS guards are gone at that point. Now, now they own the camp, and now they've got to bring in medical units. They've got to bring in quartermaster units. They've got to figure out how to get these people out of the elements, how to feed them, how to get the medical care. And I think this is an important thing to think about in terms of the liberator experience or the witness experience, is that these spaces are, are very, very mobile in the sense that people move through them for a variety of different reasons and they stay for a variety of different reasons. For example, General Levine, the, the person that I work on, um, he was an officer, he was, he was a captain at the time, and they were told that there is this prison and it sort of was in their area. The picture I was given as an intelligence officer before I got to Dachau didn't prepare me a little bit for what I found. The shock couldn't have been greater. It could have been greater, perhaps, but I don't see how. The only <laughs> camp I know for certain that American troops were ordered to take was Dachau. The 42nd Division and the 45th Infantry Division were told it was there and they were ordered to take it. And that was April 29th? They were, it was liberated yes. on the 29th. They 29th. were told it was a prison camp of some yeah. kind. It was unclear. It was still unclear even to the officers who knew something about it what it was. And they but right then there. you did have a story that, that was it Patton who went in to, to one of the camps and was, and, that, that, and Eisenhower? That was, that was Ordruf. That was the, the, the Dachau subcamp. On, on April 12th, the same day that Buchenwald was liberated, Ordruf, which is about, I forget, 45, 50 miles from Buchenwald, Eisenhower, Patton, and, and uh, several of the other top generals visited the camp and were taken on a tour. And, and what was their reaction? Uh, Patton, uh, saw the shed that had, I think it was 42 bodies just stacked in it, covered with lime, and went around behind and threw up, and then didn't go on part of the tour. Eisenhower was taken on a tour. Uh, the, there was a circle of about 30 bodies right near the entrance of the camp that had all been executed. What was on the ground was an attempt by the Germans to hide the evidence. They, they used railroad, to, uh, uh, rails and ties and, and built these big pyres and tried to burn the bodies. Eisenhower's aide was trying to move him along and it was reported that Eisenhower said, stop, I, I have to get this, I have to understand this. 
Eisenhower then wrote a letter back to General George Marshall, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, to tell him what was going on and said, you have to send people here to see this. Senators, congressmen have to come to see this. And Keith, there were also some orders that the Germans who lived there, the German citizens, when the Americans got there, they also brought the German citizens in to see these camps. Something that happened again and again and again with the German civilian populations in these areas was the excuse of, we did not know. We didn't know this was going on. We didn't know it was going on. And if you can put yourself in that history of imagining this in the 1940s, where this type of death on this level so systematic, had never been seen before. I think what's truly chilling about these camps is that you have one of the most advanced civilized nations on earth, arguably in Germany, where they take their achievements of mind, science, and how things work, engineering, and they put it towards killing human beings. I think that deep down, many Germans, of course, knew that this was, they knew what was going on. Some of these camps had human ash belching out of these factories covering the surrounding, the surrounding countryside. We wanted to mark to them that you are not going to be able to escape responsibility for this. The GIs, under orders, many of the camps went into the adjacent towns. And these camps aren't necessarily out in the woods someplace. They're right next to a city, right next to a town. And, and they brought the people from the camps in and made them march past. The, 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 the phrase was bodies stacked like cordwood. But when, when the soldiers went in, when the U.S. soldiers went in, how much interaction did they actually have with the, with the prisoners? In the case of General Levine, the person whose biography I'm, I'm working on, who am, he was in an air defense unit, air defense artillery unit, which by that point in the war was sort of superfluous. And so very often, people in his position ended up being tasked for other things. And I, I think this is how he ends up uh, in Dachau, because he is uh, sort of an extra, because the, this, there's not a threat from the German Air Force. And he ends up being sent, he, he, he arrives on or about the first day, but spends uh, up to a month, several weeks there, um, interviewing prisoners, which is an interesting and, and somewhat rare event, um, because he was involved in act, literally asking prisoners you know, or inmates, what life was like and what was going on here and what happened here. I learned that through the debriefing process that uh, what they, how they lived and what they did to one another uh, in the name of survival, the threat of death had such an impact in spite of the fact that these people were near death already but you never know, they probably didn't realize it, that they would do almost anything for one more day. Mike Hurst, what was the worst experience that uh, anyone you told, told you about that you interviewed? The worst experience, it was a, a veteran who asked me if I had ever heard of Gardelagen, and I said no, and he said look it up. And I did. Gardelegen is about 125 miles west of Berlin. Um, it was a small town. Um, there had been two trains filled with prisoners that were being moved from Dora Mittelbau camps. So altogether you had about 2,000 prisoners uh, from a variety of countries, most of them not Jews. Um, and, and they set off on a march toward this town of Gardelegen, because they were keeping away from the advancing American army. The 102nd Division was about 24 to 36 hours away. They get to the town of Gardelegen, and the Gauleiter has ordered the civilian population to help deal with this problem. There was a grain barn a, a, a little bit outside of town, a large stucco and brick facility and he had the people cover the floor of this barn with straw to a depth of about a foot. Then he had the local people carry cans of petrol and soak the, 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 the straw with gasoline. Then uh, he enlisted the, the, the local Hitler youth, the Luftwaffe cadets from an airfield that was nearby and they couldn't fly anymore because the Allied controlled the air. 
and they, they carried all the sick people who couldn't still walk, who had made it that far, in and put them in the barn. And then they put the rest of the people in the barn, and they locked all those people in the barn, surrounded it with people with rifles, civilians, kids, and set it on fire. The American soldiers get there. They made the German civilians dig graves, one grave for each victim. They made them carry them with their bare hands, to the local cemetery. The, the, the worst they did to them was prodding them along with fixed bayonets. The survivors were put in German homes and the people in those homes were told if anything happens to them, you're dead. The, the, the contrast here is, is with other places where our GIs caught up with SS guards on a death march and the guards would try, try and surrender and the GIs just blew them away. He said, you, know, you realize that's a war crime and they look at me like I'm crazy even to bring that up. But at Garda Lake, and it didn't happen. So are there stories where GIs who were liberators who were in the camps and met some of the prisoners and then reconnected with them years later? So General Levine, William Levine at this point is a captain. Um, he shows up in Dachau, uh, goes into one of these barracks um, in Dachau. It's dark and it, there are people there who are dead, dying, and, and very weak. And uh, a gentleman sort of collapses in his arms. Um, from starvation and, and, and sickness and whatnot. And, and General Levine carries him to, to the medics, um, doesn't really think much more of it, and leaves. And in 19, I guess it was 1983, the 40th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, uh, General Levine is brought to Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, in Israel, to be part of the celebration. As I left the microphone, a man ran up to me and said, General, he said, don't you remember me? And I looked at him and I said, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. He said, sure you do, you held me in your arms. And he had written a book or compiled, I, uh, I would say, a book uh, containing the names of all the Jews removed by the Nazis from Belgium and the date of their departure. And he gave me that book as a memento uh, of our having met uh, again. There was a baby born on one of the death trains that was going to this one to Mauthausen. Um, and the Americans got to Mauthausen and this one particular vet, a guy from the Chicago suburbs named Leroy Peterson, who was a medic, was walking through the women's barracks and he heard a baby crying. And he went and found this baby and the baby's mother. And the baby was covered with, with infection, carbuncles, whatever. And he had to convince the, the mother to let him take the baby to his doctor. And they managed to save the baby. Many, many years later, um, that baby grew up and became Dr. Uh, Hannah Berger Moran had a PhD, uh, studied at the University of Chicago, holds a number of, of patents on various drugs, and eventually, um, Leroy Peterson began trying to find her. He found her, and they did meet. Is there an answer to that question, is how a massacre of this horrendous nature could have gone on? The, the simple answer is there is no simple answer, and nor should there be. The motivations for participation in, in the Holocaust, from the perpetrator perspective, um, run the gamut um, from ideological belief to social psychological peer pressures to uh, simple careerism and opportunism. Keith? People recognized again and again that, hmm, if I don't go along with this, I'm going to wind up in the camp or with a bullet in my head. When we would ask, why didn't you do something? Why did you do all the things you were doing that supported or administered to the needs of that camp? You've got a variety of answers, all within the same framework, however. I would say that the most of them felt they had no choice. That's what they would say. That the, they felt if they didn't comply, that there would be reprisals against them. Do uh, historians have a responsibility to try to find that answer? I think so. I mean, I think 
the fact that we're still asking this question of how does this happen and why do people do this indicates that we don't have a good answer for it yet. I don't believe that we've perfected ourselves as angels in the 70 years past then. It's part of a very ugly part of human nature that perhaps we confront that good and evil resides in each of us. People have to know, however, in spite of my inadequacy, the world cannot survive another event such as a Holocaust. It can't. We will lose all our humanity because we lost a great deal of it then. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I would like to thank Waitman Bourne, Michael Hirsch, and Keith Huxon for a really fascinating discussion about the Americans who liberated Nazi concentration camps. And to learn more about the topics discussed today, please visit the Pritzker Military Library in Chicago and the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. And on behalf of the Pritzker Military Library, I'm Elizabeth Brackett. Thanks for watching. National World War II Museum in partnership with the Pritzker Military Library.